we do have um, some announcements that are going to try to keep these brief. Um, the roses on the altar are in, on, are in honor and memory of Chris Kirk, um, whose birthday was July 29th, 19, whose, whose date of birth was July 29th, 1957, and he passed away on March 28th, 2018. So we remember him this day. And the flowers on the altar were sponsored by the of all the hardworking closed closet volunteers by St. Burke. There are announcements about uh, the coming up there to Buckhead on August 7th. And if you're interested in learning more about St. Mark's, I have coffee with the pastor the next two Sundays in my office at 915. Um, everyone is welcome and you're under no obligation um, to join the church if you come to that. Um, there's been several questions people have asked about our worship for August, which is, that's a good question. We're going to be worshiping in the fellowship hall, and um, I've tried to, tried to explain what we're doing. We are having regular worship services. Um, these are not Sunday school classes of, like, where uh, we're just taking random questions, but we're trying to get some questions beforehand, and the sermons, the sermon is going to be something of trying to answer uh, deep theological questions that people have. Um, and those are going to be what really takes place during the sermon time. Um, and we're going, he is going to answer them, and I'm going to answer them. Um, but it's not going to be a Sunday school forum, and we are going to be having a sort of normal worship service. Um, and that's going to be what's going to happen at the time of the sermon. And we're not doing the questions right there. These are going to be questions we got beforehand, and we're going to take time to give really pretty comprehensive answers. So um, there's going to be a lot of preparation on our part. This is not an off the top of your head kind of um, routine. Um, we're taking this very seriously. That said, we've gotten, I think, four or five um, deep theological questions that have come in. If you have any uh, major theological questions that have come in, um, please, you know, please email me or call me or let me know. Um, and I'll be happy to try to tackle them. And if I find the question to be too difficult, I'll have the answer. That, 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 work, that works easier. Um, actually, we're both trying to uh, figure stuff out. Um, Barbara Cornigan has an announcement she'd like to make. Good morning. Um, I come to you this morning as your church council president. I would like for you to look in your bulletin. There is a note with information about a special upcoming meeting, congregational meeting, on August the 12th. If you have questions, see me after church. But please mark that day to stay after church on the 12th. So we hopefully it will just be a short congregation meeting. Thank you. And lastly, and very importantly, we welcome all those visiting with us today. We have a um, sign-in book at the back of the sanctuary. Um, if you're willing to sign in, we'd be happy to follow up with you if you have any questions about the church. I'm always happy to take time to answer. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place.
The people of ancient Israel gathered and sang. They sang songs of anguish and praise. They asked us a question. How can it keep from singing?
You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful, is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I, if I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, you are there. Or even your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me becomes night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes behold my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me. When none of them as you but none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the same. I come to the end. I am still with you. The second reading today comes from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of the body, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness? and to walk humbly with your God. Here is the reading of the word. Today's message, How Can I Keep From Singing Wherever We Go, will now be delivered by the Reverend Dr. John Manzo. Let us pray. O oh God, how can we keep from singing when you are present with us always? A minister by the name of Chris Gordon told the story about his first year at college. He attended a junior college and one of his first classes was Psychology 101. And it was his first day of class, his first class in college, and he was really nervous. And the tension began to build in the classroom, filled with all these young people waiting to start college, waiting for the professor to arrive. It was absolute silence. And the clock came to 9 o'clock, and everybody in the room was a little scared and a little disappointed that the professor hadn't shown up yet. Five minutes went by, no professor. Finally, one grave student stood up and said, Professor, it was only an associate professor, and they could leave after waiting only 15 minutes. Everyone looked around and said, Well, that sounds pretty good. It seemed to break the tension, and then the conversation in the classroom began. Everybody began to talk about the professor, if anyone knew anything about him. There were numerous answers. One girl said he, she had heard he was a hard grader. Another commented that she heard he was really strict. Another said that he gave a lot of homework. There were numerous comments, not all of them very complimentary. And then there were jokes about the professor, many of them at the professor's expense. Finally, at the 15-minute mark, 
after everyone had been laughing for a while, this person who seemed to know all the rules stood up and said, well, it's been 15 minutes, but I'm not going to leave. In fact, I think I'm going to stay and begin the presentation of today's class. The professor had been there the entire time. This brings me to this love-hate relationship I have with Psalm 139. I have a sign posted in my office. Bidden or not bidden, God is present. I have a love-hate relationship with that as well. It's based upon the premise of Psalm 139. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter how far we run, God is present. I love it when it reminds me that no matter how life is difficult, how difficult life is, how complex things are, and how much trouble I'm feeling, God is present. I like it. The bad news is that whenever I say or do something unpleasing to God, God is present. Even the psalmist had this dilemma. On one hand, he's talking about how all of this knowledge is just too wonderful for him to know. He extols the virtues of God knitting him together in his mother's womb. The language is magnificent and lofty. On the other hand, he seems to lament that no matter where he goes, he cannot hide from God. God is always present everywhere. And we realize that we are known and loved and presented with God all the time. So all of this begs a question. How do we respond to a God who is present to us always and who loves us always? One of the best references to me is from this passage from Michael. Michael was a prophet who addressed many of the wrongs of the people and said about a lot of the things they had done against God. The people were wondering how they would get God back in God's good graces because they had sinned so grievously. They finally asked the question, what is it that we need to do? What must we do to please the Lord? Would it be thousands of rams sacrificed to God? 10,000 rivers of oil in reference to the precious olive oil that was used for food and in lamps? Would it mean sacrificing their firstborn? The offenses are evidently grievous and people expect the worst. But the prophet says no. None of these. Only three things are expected. Do justice love kindness, and walk humbly with God. This is startling. God is not looking for retribution from our sin and failings, but God invites us to live faithfully. God's omnipresence is not a way that God seeks to trap us, but a way to invite us into a closer and deeper relationship. But we are challenged first to do justice. And sometimes justice is hard to do when injustice goes all around us. USA Today recently did an investigation and came to the conclusion of all the first world countries, the United States is the most dangerous country in which to give birth. Every year in the United States, more than 50,000 mothers are severely injured at childbirth and 700 die. Deadly deliveries, women are dying and suffering life-altering injuries during childbirth because a lot of the hospitals and a lot of the doctors are not available for them. And in cost-cutting measures, a lot of long-known safety procedures have been overlooked. This becomes an issue of injustice when we as a first world country are not protecting those who are giving birth. A few weeks ago, I talked about Anthony Ray Hinton who spent 30 years on death row in Alabama for crimes he didn't commit. The sad part about that was many of the people knew he didn't commit the crimes but kept him in jail anyway. And if it wasn't for an organization called Equal Justice Initiative, he probably would have been executed. The Equal Justice Initiative tells us that up to 10% of the people on death row right now 
did not commit the crimes they were convicted of. Most of them were poor, most of them were defended by inadequate counsel, by overextended and overmatched public defender systems. And this was a lack of justice. And the flip side of that, you know, you think about the flip side of that is if all of these people are in jail for crimes they did not commit, if there's, if there's injustice there, the other injustice is the people who did commit the crimes are not in jail. This is also a lack of justice. And when there is a lack of justice, the system is always off. One of the great debates is, what do we do as a society? I was thinking about this as a church. What do we do? The population of New Albany is a little under 40,000 people, and we're living in a cluster of people on this side of the river of about 100,000 people. And if you think that maybe 10,000 of those people are living in poverty, over the course of a week, we are impacting maybe the lives of a couple hundred of those people. And you say, oh my gosh, we're not really making a dent. What are we doing with this for? But the reality is, for those people, for those situations in life, we're doing life-changing things. We are working hard to do that. And it's an important thing, because doing justice often begins by feeding those who need food, for clothing those who need clothing, for giving shelter to those who need shelter. That is what the Bible speaks about doing justice. The first thing about doing justice is actually doing it. And then, in doing justice, there is the thing about kindness. We're not just supposed to do it. We're supposed to do it with a smile on our face and love in our hearts. There's a little story about a little, a little boy. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong story. Um, there's, actually the, that, there's actually a story about, never mind. I changed my sermon, I apologize. The second thing I was saying about justice is loving kindness and I was on the wrong page. I should go back to bed. <laughs> Think about kindness. Kindness comes in a variety of ways. A man walked into a restaurant in a strange town. The waiter came up and asked him for his order. The man was forlorn and lonely, and he said, I need we love and a kind word. The waiter went, to the kitchen, came back with a meatloaf dinner. And the man said, okay, what's the kind word? The waiter gently put the dish down, bent over, and whispered gently in the man's ear, don't eat the meatloaf. <laughs> with having a loving heart, doing the right thing for the right reasons. We do it bitterly, we're doing the wrong thing. I had said to a lot of you that I had gone to a Roman Catholic <coughs> seminary college, so I did, my, I did all of my education and seminary experiences, and when I went to college, some of us were more civilized than others. Just think about a group of 18 to 22 year old young men going to a Catholic seminary. And mm -hmm. the freshman year, a lot of us were 18, and some were from rather refined families, and some of us were not. I was one of the were not. And there was a table in the dining room uh, that we would go at, and there was one table in the dining room that was noisier than all the other tables. It was rowdier than all the other tables. That was noisier in every possible way than all the other tables. And it was nicknamed the animal table. And I sat at the animal table. And I would like to tell you I didn't fit in. But I fit in just fine when I was that age. And I would like to tell you that I was an ambassador to good manners at the animal table. Was not. But one of the things that happened was in the dining room was on the other end of the dining room was a little sign that said, remember, 
Jesus is the unseen dinner guest at every table. The rector of the seminary one day moved the sign. And guess where he hung it? Guess what table he hung it next to? That as we sat there and looked at it, we were reminded that Jesus was the unseen dinner guest at every table. It was jarring. It was jarring to all of us. I don't know if our behavior improved a whole lot. We need to come walking humbly to God. I live with two eternal truths about myself. My first eternal truth is that there is a God. My second eternal truth is that I am not God. When I look at the world, and I look at the way I interact with the world, I'm overwhelmed with so many issues and so many questions that I often find myself foolish. Sometimes I work to live personal challenges. And of late, I've been living a personal challenge. In my prayer time, I have been reading a book entitled Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-step guide to genuine self-esteem. St. Benedict and his rules spent a long time on humility because he thought that humility was one of the most important aspects of a person's faith. One of the obstacles of humility, he said, and one of the biggest obstacles of humility is grumbling. Grumbling, he observed, is something we do because we think that we ourselves, our wants and our needs, our opinions come first. The challenge, the author said, was to be aware of how often we grumble and to work to stop doing it. I often pray and read this right before leaving for work. And so I thought about that, read this chapter about grumbling, and thought, I'm going to work on grumbling. I am not going to grumble today. I am not going to grumble today. I got in my car, and I drove to St. Mark's, and at the exit for Spring Street, somebody was driving very slowly in front of me. And I began grumbling. Oh, Lord, did I grumble. And I thought, oh, no, I'm grumbling. But then something hit me that was good. I was aware that I was grumbling. And sometimes the first step to moving forward is being aware. And so ever since that time, I would like to tell you that I have succeeded in no more grumbling. And if I told you that, I'd be lying through my teeth. But I'm aware of it. And awareness is my first step to grow. Humility is important. Humility is important. And we need to realize the only way to be close to God is to learn to walk from to God. So today we're challenged. We're challenged and comforted by two passages of Scripture. Psalm 139 gives us the thrilling and simultaneously troubling recognition that God is always with us. And Micah gives us the response on how to do it. It's, just, it's a reminder to us that God knows us and loves us. And God invites us to know and love God. Amen.
Shirley Wright. Um, we also asked the Mad Lab um, at the Boris Sanders, um, Mike, Mike Johnson, uh, mother-in-law, as well as his uh, soft caller, and his daughter and son-in-law. And Jillian Wells asked us for continued prayers for her 13-year-old granddaughter, uh, Lauren, who suffers from severe arthritis. Um, we also pray for people in um, the west, western part of our country who have been really afflicted by um, tremendous um, fire. And for many people, um, um, especially in the southeastern part of the country, and northeastern part of the country, who have been just sort of swamped with tremendous amounts of rain and summer. Um, other people you'd like us to remember the prayer. Yes, Brian. Tim and Linda, Tim and Lily Donahoe, and they're in Reading, California, and they're and they're back to Reading, and the fire comes away. Okay. Some joys. Uh, I don't know. How many of you saw the play at Wits End? What did you think of it? JR is usual hold off of masterpiece. Well done. And um, you have two more performances. Are they sold out yet? Ten seats left for tonight. Ten seats are left for tonight. So this has been probably the most successful play we've had. Very good. If you haven't seen it, get one of those ten seats. They're great. Other joys.
We give you thanks and praise always, O oh God, for your love surpasses all, and your will is ever good. Like a potter at the wheel, you created every part of us, shaping us in secret and hidden parts. We read your inmost thoughts and desires and keep your hand upon us, reshaping us as seems good to you. Whenever we allow ourselves to become this happen through your allegiance to those who do not walk in your ways, by acts of your own, by acts of our own will, you are with us. Loving and creative God, make us the people you want us to be, and help us to follow in the path of Christ, Jesus your Son, every day. And we proclaim your love, saying that all that we do and all that we say to all people we need. Let us pray in silence for all of the people we need here in your We pray to God, our Father.
Lord, help us use this offering today to further our work in your community uh, with the knowledge that you are wherever you are, wherever we are, wherever our work is. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite everyone to turn and face each other and join together as we commission each other. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Still, before, as a people, very blessed.